So we are the Knoxville History Project. I said this every week, and our mission is very simple. We research and preserve and promote the history and culture of Knoxville, Tennessee. Beautiful, simple mission. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, we, ha we have this new engage section of our website, and on there, uh, we've broken off a few things from the portal, which are maybe a little bit more staticky. But uh, if you go to the history happy hour section uh, that Nicole's put up for us, that's where you can access all of the uh, rec recorded Zooms uh, sessions that we've done. We didn't record all of them, took a little bit of a uh, learning curve, but we, we have quite a lot. And uh, Nicole's got them in all kinds of um, subject uh, subjects for you, categories rather. So, um, but also you can learn about Knoxville walking tours with Laura, who's been one of our mainstay uh, audience members of the last year, or driving tours and, Fee for service research, I'll throw that one out. Um, you may not know, but uh, Jack and I, we, we do uh, fee for service. Uh, if you have a building or a site or you're interested in a certain topic, um, we've done all kinds of research for buildings. And even though we don't kind of share it necessarily uh, publicly, though we do sometimes, uh, as in the case of the Cal Johnson uh, building history, which is on the website now, uh, a lot of it kind of feeds naturally into a lot of the work we do um, either now or in the future. So uh, talk to us about that if you're interested in a specific thing that you'd like to see done. Again, every week, I want to thank our city council members, Lynn Fugate and Charles Thomas uh, for supporting this series, which uh, will continue in some part, uh, hopefully on a monthly basis at uh, some point in the summer and beyond as, as the demand uh, allows. Uh, but I really want to thank uh, Paula and Tom Wellborn who are with us tonight and have been with us many times uh, for sponsoring this talk, uh, our Parks and Gardens, which has kind of been a bit of a hoop putting together. So uh, I'll throw it over to Jack and I'm going to contribute a little bit here and there tonight. So I'll we'll catch up with you in a little while. Jack, hand over to you. All right. All right. Thanks, Paul. And, and thanks for uh, joining us. Thanks very much to both Paul and Nicole for, for making this happen every week for since last last May. Um, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun and I appreciate you all joining us. We're not giving up on it all together, uh, but we're gonna take a bit of a summer break and uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, our subject is our parks and gardens. And this is uh, in, some, in some cities uh, that plan parks and gardens, it might not be quite as interesting a subject. Uh, it might be, a, they might have great parks and gardens, uh, but very deliberately planned with lots of uh, uh, community effort going into the planning. We haven't done things that way in Knoxville, and that's part of what it makes it an interesting, interesting subject. It's a, it's a chapter, I never thought about this until uh, we wrote our book, uh, Historic Knoxville, The Curious Visitor's Guide. It's been out for a couple of years now. It's a whole chapter, it's about 20 pages about parks and gardens in their illustrated uh, chapter. And uh, it's, uh, I, I realized then that we have a great diversity of, of parks uh, in Knoxville and a great diversity of stories about how each of the parks came to be. Um, without city planning, uh, we, uh, we, we, we tend to be kind of haphazard in the way parks have come about, uh, but it's in many ways worked out pretty well. Paul, do we have the picture of what Knoxville looked like in, in 1886? Here's a here's a picture of Knoxville in 1886. Do you see a do you see room for parks there? At this area down here is a pretty steep hill going down. That's why there aren't any uh, any any uh, buildings there, and uh, you know a couple of spots possibly. But this was a densely packed city. Um, there there almost every square foot of uh, of, of urban Knoxville had uh, buildings on it. Uh, they, you know buildings that made money, and that's what people were concerned about then. Um, and the idea of parks, people began talking, gosh, why don't we have a park as early, early as the Civil War era? Uh, and, uh, but people, nobody was willing to donate the land or the money or whatever it took to actually establish a public park uh, for quite a long time. So instead of parks, we relied on one uh, kind of extraordinary, uh, kind of what they called a, a garden uh, park uh, or a garden cemetery which was on the north side of town uh, and it was pretty handy to downtown and a lot of people would wander over there and it was called uh, Old Gray Cemetery. Um, this was uh, a, a place that people used as a park uh, and uh, it was a beautiful place with uh, a lot of greenery, a lot of interesting sculpture and people would go there on a Sunday afternoon even have a picnic uh, there, would go there on, on with dates sometimes, would walk around Old Gray Cemetery 
and that was uh, that was uh, something they they enjoyed. Um, but the lack of planning is unfortunate on one level, but it left us with lots of odd and memorable parks uh, with interesting and very different stories of their very different uh, evolutions. Uh, the first one I'll mention is one that has been described as the oldest park. It's, it's uh, one that we still have, I'm glad to say, called Circle Park. Uh, many people might assume that Circle Park is a, uh, is a landscaping project by UT. And it's not. This is an early picture of Circle Park, and it's a picture of UT, but UT is at a distance. Circle Park was uh, a place where there were some houses uh, built around it. Uh, we don't see the, the size of many of the houses that were on Circle Park in the 1880s. We're looking down toward the kind of uh, uh, more modest houses, but that's UT on the hill in the distance. Circle Park was then a privately owned area, and uh, but Circle Park itself was you could say it was kind of like just a, a, a an 1880s uh, landscaper's idea to make a place more uh, agreeable to wealthy people who wanted to live there but it was also it was also open to the public it was it was not a city knoxville city park it was a west knoxville city park west knoxville was a separate uh, uh organization on the west west side of, of knoxville that included fort sanders and also west now ut campus uh, but they had they established a park there in the 1880s and it's interesting for a few reasons. One is uh, uh, because it was a it, it was a streetcar destination. It was a place. It was it was so open to the public that you could get a streetcar on Bay Street and you know, the Circle Park streetcar and go down there and and have a picnic or play some some uh, pickup baseball or, or whatever was going on there that day. It was a, a little refuge very close to to town. Um, but uh, but it was also interesting because there's a uh, we we know for sure that the great uh, park planner and landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted had some kind of a project in Knoxville in 1893. He talked about it when he was planning the Chicago World's Fair, but didn't talk about it enough to know what it was. Uh, and one, there are two major candidates for what he was working on here. One was Circle Park, and there it had, does have some features of an Olmsted-ish type park, including the exposed stone that was that he liked and it was otherwise unusual. In, uh, in park in parks at the time, exposed natural stone, uh, and also some exotic shrubbery that was there a few years ago uh, that was rather old, uh, that kind of shrubbery that, that he was planting in New York and elsewhere. Uh, but the other candidate was another park that was never really uh, came to complete fruition. It was on top of the bluff across the river. It was only used as a park for a year or two and it was never really completed. It was the one that was connected with the cable car uh, that we've, I think, talked about before. Um, but anyway, this Circle Park was unrelated to the university for 75 years. It was just a, a, a park uh, that happened to be near a university, but then it was acquired by the university during the urban renewal era in the 1960s. Uh, and all the houses around it were torn down and they built, uh, they built McClung Museum, they built the uh, administrative building and the communications building where WOT and other things uh, happen today. Um, uh, but one of the, another early park, uh, and I think a more popular and more familiar park is, uh, is the next one, uh, Chilhawi Park. Uh, it was uh, on, the, on the east side of town, of course, the same place it is now. Uh, it's changed a little bit. It used to have a much bigger lake. This lake was established by a, uh, a dairyman from New York named Hernando Cortez Beeman. And he called this, sometimes it was called Beeman Lake. Sometimes called uh, kind of jokingly Lake Odyssey. It sounded like a like a sort of like a Cherokee name, but it was a kind of play on words that you Odyssey Odyssey this lake. Um, but uh, people would come out here even before there was a streetcar. But this it says something about the popularity of this place is that this was the very first electric streetcar destination in East Tennessee. Electric the very first electric streetcar ever built by William Buse McAdoo. In 1890, William Gibbs McAdoo, who was later U.S. Secretary of the Treasury and later ran for president in the 1920s, uh, as a young man, uh, this, uh, planned this this streetcar that went uh, from downtown to Chilhowie Park in 1890, and it was used a lot, uh, in, especially when there were events there as uh, as years went by. But they had boating there. I love this uh, this these lake scenes. They also had something uh, that I'd love to see learn more about. Uh, I don't know how often they did it, but something called water baseball, where they would uh, have a floating baseball and you would hit the ball and then swim to first base and then try to steal a second. You know, it was uh, 
uh, uh, fascinating uh, 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 sort of uh, sort of sort of thing. Yeah, there 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 are lots of misspellings on the on the on the postcards, but. Uh, Anyway, it was a it was a very popular place uh, for many many years. Uh, Jelly Park. It was uh, for balloon ascensions, uh, things like that. Uh, but also, it's where a lot of people encountered uh, football for the first time. Uh, the, so the very first football games in the area were played there in the 1890s. Although I think baseball was more common uh, there. Uh, also, uh, the conservation expositions, of course, the 18 uh, the 1910 to 1913 era, which uh, was known for. Uh, for uh, learning about conservation and 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 uh, serious subjects, but also had motorcycle races and uh, and airplane landings and uh, and impressionist art ex exhibitions, as well as the Negro uh, Pavilion, which was uh, was was built entirely by Knox Knoxville College uh, students. But this is the one remnant of that whole era. This is the only the oldest building by far on Chelyabinsk Park site. And the only remnant of the, the exposition era, and that's this is the old bandstand. It was built in 1910, marble bandstand, and uh, they would have uh, uh, bands playing on it, as you could see there, and people would dance in the lawn uh, well into the night uh, to the to the sound of the. the they say an Italian band was playing there. Uh, uh, I don't know if they were playing Italian music or what, but but I'm glad it's, it's still there. It's been fairly recently restored, and uh, and. Uh, Quite a, a real landmark for for East Oxford this place, um, but uh, anyway, this uh, great 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 deal of history to to Chilhowee Park is a place where you encountered so many things for the first time, including a new kind of music called rock and roll. We did a whole Zoom uh, about a year ago about how rock, Knoxville discovered rock and roll at uh, the Chilhowee Park Auditorium, is which we now know as the Jacob Building, and these were rock and roll shows that included. Uh, performers like Bo Diddley, Little Richard, Fast Domino, Chuck Berry, uh, lots and lots of others uh, were there uh, that uh, at the old Jacob at the Jacob Building that's still there today. Uh, this is the old uh, uh, liberal arts building from the Exposition era, and and that kind of played the same role because later on it was uh, it, uh, it was uh, a place where uh, people like uh, like Ella Fitzgerald performed with, with Chick Webb and his band on, on a New Year's Eve in 1936, I think. Um, and uh, Louis Armstrong played there and other, other people. But these shows, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, um, uh, were, were segregated, but they were segregated in the favor of the, the majority Black audience that was, was, uh, was attending them. Uh, they were on the dance floor and had, had the tables and the white people, white people were allowed only as spectators in the in the gallery above, uh, and that was true for both this building and for the Jacob Building. And you can see that old gallery in the Jacob Building uh, today, uh, which is where they had uh, so many many interesting concerts. Uh, I think there should be a plaque for uh, all the the, the, the fascinating concerts. You know, this may be where the Everly Brothers uh, encounter first encountered Bo Diddley and, and his music. Uh, so it's a uh, it's an interesting uh, a whole interesting place. Chilhowee Park is a place that we encounter things for the first for the first time, and in many in many ways. Um, but uh, but next uh, during the same period, this was again a, a, a streetcar ride about three miles east of downtown. Uh, and oh, and here's the uh, Chilhowee Park. Uh, it had a little amusement park, uh, the roller coaster, uh, and this was the part that was uh, pretty strictly segregated. Um, Oh yeah, I mentioned the uh, Sturkey Park title. Uh, Chilhowee Park was because of uh, the beneficence of uh, James Sturkey was renamed Sturkey Park for a period of about a, a, a decade or so in the 1920s. And then it went back to the Chilhowee Park name, I believe in the 1930s. Um, but this was, the, uh, this was the amusement park area. This is the part when when people uh, like like Bob Booker uh, remember uh, that it was Howie Park was segregated and, and there was a very short period, uh, originally just one day a year, uh, eventually one week a year, that black children were allowed to in, into Shelby Park. This is what they were talking about. This was the part that was that was strictly whites only most of the year, but it was still there and it was still I guess it was into it was no longer segregated in the '60s when it was still there. When I I remember it, this was a a standing amusement park uh, that was uh, at Chilhowee Park uh, up until the 1960s, uh, and uh, was, you know had a, quite a, quite a few little features there. All right, uh, next uh, the uh, second oldest uh, uh, park uh, 
is uh, Fountain City Park, uh, and this was uh, you could argue that it's 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 even older than Chilhowee Park because this this plot of land here where the where the water comes out of the mountain and, and flows to to form First Creek at uh, right right just as it does today. This is one of the most beautiful parks in town, very well maintained, not by the city of Knoxville but by the Fountain City Lions Club. Um, uh, Fountain City Park was at the place that had been a place for camp meetings, uh, religious uh, tent meetings back in the 1860s and 70s. Uh, and it was believed to have be a perfectly clean living kind of place, that this was a uh, this was a place where there was no pollution, no air pollution, and also no alcohol, the, the other kind of pollution. Uh, so that was, uh, uh, Fountain City Park was considered a very clean living place, a perfect place for uh, these uh, religious retreats uh, that, that went on there. But by the 1880s, they had built a resort there, uh, the Fountainhead Hotel, and it became more of a secular uh, attraction for and people from around the country would go there uh, just to live in this perfectly pristine, clean, uh, beautiful place uh, away from everything else. Uh, but it was it was uh, also connected by rail, a different kind of rail, not uh, an electric streetcar to begin with. But uh, but the uh, um, the the, it, it, the it was connected to downtown Knoxville by what they call a dummy line, and it was a steam trolley basically that ran from Emory Place, uh, uh, Emory Park up to uh, up to up to uh, Fountain City Park. And this was, uh, uh, you know, people would take this, uh, especially on on holidays, Labor Day, Fourth of July, for they would have big events and thousands of people would go to Chilhowee to uh, Fountain, 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 Fountain City Park up there. It was known as Fountain City Park by 1891, uh, even though it was just kind of a, a privately owned uh, uh, area. I think the utility company owned it at one time. Uh, but it was uh, there was a place where people had picnics and and uh, and foot races and all kinds of competitions on Fourth of July, uh, band concerts and and they, and people would would dance in their grass and and also they would have politicians uh, uh, coming there. Uh, and we have kind of a surprising uh, picture of a politician I think coming up uh, for that. Uh, uh, but but anyway, this was uh, uh, all. all People are very familiar with with Fountain City Park in, in those days, uh, and it's a wonderful place. If you haven't been there, it's just a, it, it's just a, a almost unbelievably a, a perfect place to 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 to, to wander around on a on a on a on a summer day. Uh, what's the next picture, Paul? All right, this is uh, this is Eugene Debs himself, uh, one of the most controversial figures in American history, uh, drawing a crowd at at, uh, at uh, Fountain, uh, Fountain City Park. Uh, this is one of only two, uh, I know uh, uh, our board member, Ernie Freeberg, uh, wrote a book about Eugene Debs and he said there are only two known pictures of Eugene Debs uh, speaking outside and they're both at Fountain City Park in Knoxville. He was of course the socialist who ran for president many times. And before the Bolshevik revolution, uh, a lot of working people thought so socialism sounded like a great idea. And I think it was the violence of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 that that uh, soured people on the the whole idea of it. Uh, but but Debs was a, was a was a crowd pleaser when he came to Knoxville in 1905. Uh, this wasn't the only time he ever came here, but he was always he always came here and sometimes drew crowds in the in the thousands to his uh, to his talks. Uh, but uh, yeah, what's the next one, Paul? This is at Fountain City Park. Here's another one. The the only other picture of Eugene Debs outside. Is, is this one, and it's it's you see this pop up in uh, in documentaries, uh, PBS documentaries about socialism and Debs and so forth, but they never they never identify where this is. It's uh, I wish they would, uh, but uh, anyway, the uh, but people would would ride again the dummy line up from uh, from uh, uh, downtown to to, uh, to to catch the uh, catch the uh, the the uh, shows, but uh, but anyway. But that's uh yeah that's uh that's Fountain City Park which has you know, just a, a whole lot of as much uh, as much history as as uh, as uh, uh, the uh, as Chilhowee Park does. Uh, hey Jack. Yeah. Uh, the Lions Club involvement goes back a long, long way, doesn't it? Uh, do you remember? It does. In the fact, uh, it it came. Uh, the the Lions Club came in in 1932. Uh, it became a permanent public park uh, in 1932. It had been privately owned, which meant who knows what's going to happen to it next year. But the Lions Club made a, made a deal and, and I think acquired the property and, and made it uh, 
made it permanently available to the public in 1932. And it's been a, uh, a, a run by the Lions Club and again, not by the city of Knoxville ever since then. All right, well, I mentioned, just mentioned Emory Place, which was the uh, place to catch a, had to catch the little train up to, uh, up to uh, uh, Fountain City Park. Uh, and this is Emory Place today. And this, uh, this, uh, is, is, uh, this building is the old Walla Walla Chewing Gum Factory. Uh, uh, which uh, is, I'm glad to say, is still there. And now, the, uh, now part of it is the Crafty Bastard uh, Brew Pub, a uh, very uh, nice place to spend a, a, a summer afternoon. They have outdoor seating. Um, but this, is, uh, uh, this was a, 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 place, a place that developed completely accidentally because this was not meant to be a park. It was meant to be a marketplace. Uh, they established a market called the Central Market. It was meant to compete with and eventual, uh, eventually succeed perhaps uh, uh, Market Square because they thought this uh, on the north side, it would be more convenient to people. They didn't have to deal with the, the narrow streets and, and crowded uh, bad traffic, even in the, in the horse strong wagon era, uh, especially then traffic was really bad and it could sometimes take an hour for a farmer to get from the, uh, the fringes of downtown to uh, Market Square. So this was uh, considered to, to be good for farmers and good for residents of, of Knoxville, especially on the north side who wanted to shop there. And they built a big market house there, a uh, big kind of a bent elbow of a building that, that uh, intersected both with uh, uh, Central on one side and Broadway on the other. And all these other buildings like this one popped up around it. The, the build, building in the middle is wooden, but they built brick buildings all around it. So this kind of forms a sort of almost like a fossil of the uh, shape of the original market building. Uh, well, it was a, it was a public private partnership and there were lots of allegations of collusion and, uh, and under uh, kind of under the table, uh, underhanded dealing, uh, about it. And it was eventually a, a failure at, uh, it, you, you, at, the market house was, was full of, of renters at first and it, each year there are fewer and fewer. And by the early 1900s, it, uh, there were, there were very few uh, of any sort and they finally just gave up on it. Uh, someone tore down the building and moved uh, moved it ostensibly to, to build a service station in uh, in South Knoxville. Uh, I would love to know more about that. Uh, but the rest of the buildings are still are still there, and they said, "Well, what are we going to do with the space?" And in 1904, 1905, uh, it, and we said, "Gosh, well, we've always been saying we wanted a downtown park. Here it is." In 1905, they christened this Emory Park. It was named for Isaac Emory. Uh, who was, uh, I think, the most famous person killed in the New Market train wreck of 1904. Uh, of course, the train station is very near here. Uh, Isaac Emery was an old man at the time, but he was a very popular uh, 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 minister, a uh, Presbyterian minister who had, from up north, from New York, I believe, who came down here and introduced the idea of Sunday school to Tennessee. They say that he walked uh, unarmed to every county in the entire state, uh, bearing the, the tidings of, uh, of, of adding a Sunday school to your church service. Uh, and he was a very popular guy in 1905. He was actually on the train to go get, deliver a eulogy for a funeral, uh, ironically, when he was, uh, he was killed in the New Market train wreck that killed about 70 something people. But uh, his family owned a lot of land, uh, Emory Land, uh, New Boulevard on the north side of town also was, is named for the same family. Uh, but they called it Emory Park, and it, it worked as a park uh, for about uh, uh, 40 years or so. Here's a pretty rare picture of, uh, of Emory Park uh, when it was Emory Park, and it was the whole area, middle area was green and planted with trees. Um, I don't know much about this campaign as being, uh, as being uh, advertised here. We see buildings around it on all sides. Um, but over the years, especially after World War II, people started saying, gosh, what do we need a park for? We need a parking lot. That's what we need. And they just paved the whole thing in the 1950s. And it was, uh, it was a parking lot. Uh, and uh, and uh, thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Dwayne, Dwayne Grieve, who's a member of our board, uh, an architect who's made a big impact on, on downtown Knoxville in lots of ways over the years, uh, it kind of came partway back to park status when it was, it was landscaped as a uh, as a uh, as a semi park place with some with some parking as well but if you want to find this a lot of people are, are surprised to hear about emory, emory park they've never been there but all you have to do is go to the far north end of gay street just go go to gay street until it vanishes and then you're in in emory park gay street actually ends right right here 
Uh, but that that statue you might recognize that statue has been in four different kind of migrated around town has been in four different places in uh, downtown Knoxville It's currently at the fire hall on Summit Hill uh, Drive at uh, Henley Street and it'll probably migrate again because they're talking about moving the fire hall so uh, but it's been uh, it was here for for some years uh, uh, in the early early part of the century but uh, Anyway, that's uh, uh, we're 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 lucky to have this little patch of patch of grass here. By the way, it's right across Broadway from from Old Gray Cemetery. You can park here and walk over to Old Gray if you if you'd like to, as I some of us do. But uh, all right, and this is uh, uh, this is this is Caswell Park. Uh, you may not recognize that that uh, that gate is fairly fairly recent, uh, but Caswell Park uh, uh, it goes back quite a long way. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, established in 19, uh, suggested in 1913 by William Caswell. He was an interesting guy. And I, uh, I, I'm, I uh, have done some research into him. In the, in the past, I have used shorthand and called him a Confederate veteran. I don't think I'll do that anymore because he, uh, I, I did some, some uh, specific research and found out that he, his, his uh, service uh, involved only a, a, a few months as a courier to his father, who, uh, when 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 William Caswell was only 15 years old, he was a courier for his father, who was in charge of the militia in Knoxville during the Confederate occupation. Uh, and his father never went to battle or anything. He, was, and in fact, was murdered uh, early in the war. Uh, and apparently, uh, William Caswell, the son, went to uh, boarding school in New Jersey after that, while the war, while the war was still going on. So uh, it's uh, it, it kind of an unusual uh, uh, fellow to call a Confederate veteran. So I'm, I'm not going to to uh, do that anymore. He, he never called himself that in his lifetime that I know of. But but he was uh, but he was an interesting guy. He was an early baseball player uh, here in Knoxville when we were just discovering this new sport of baseball, and that might have been part of his motive for establishing this this park. Uh, he was a, a real uh, hustler of a businessman. He was a, a dealt in furniture, manufacturing, and sales. He was in banking for a while. He was in real estate. Uh, he dabbled in politics. Uh, but around 1900, he bought some land in Florida and began growing grapefruit down there and became well known for Caswell grapefruit, which was a big deal uh, in Knoxville every, every year when it came in. Um, but uh, but he made quite a lot of money at that. And uh, by 1913, he said, look, I've got a few acres of land uh, close to downtown. I'm going to donate to the city if the city can match with some more acres. We can have a nice city park for the first time. And why don't we do that? And uh, uh, one of the pe first people, and remember this name, one, one of the people who was all for this was a woman named Betty Tyson. Uh, she was a leader of the City Beautiful League, and this was a new idea that cities should be beautiful, and it was kind of promoted by the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. But, uh, but Betty Tyson uh, and, and, and some other women mainly were promoting this idea of public parks, uh, that, that this is something we should finally do after all these years of talking about, was go and build public parks. But she was all for this. It was established, open in 1916. Uh, with uh, ball fields, uh, uh, baseball and football fields, and four tennis courts. Um, but baseball was what it became especially known for. By 1921, it was the home of the Knoxville Pioneers, which was the Knoxville's pro baseball team uh, at, before it was known as the Smokies. So it was, I think it was rebranded re the Smokies after the National Park Movement started to, to try to connect with that, with that enthusiasm. But the Knoxville Pioneers was, uh, was an earlier baseball team, not the first baseball team. Knoxville's got a really deep baseball history. Uh, but, uh, but the uh, Knoxville Pioneers were, this was their home, their home field. Um, they were, uh, they were a, a white baseball team. Uh, and there were, there were, there was also a black pro baseball team in town uh, at the same time that, that, uh, that uh, played at another place that was called the uh, Booker T. Washington field. Um, but, uh, and later on at Leslie Street uh, field. But uh, but this was uh, this was this was a baseball place. And it was not just local baseball that was exciting enough, and they built a stadium for for that. But we would started to have uh, lots of exhibition games uh, by big league teams, including the uh, the, uh, the New York Yankees in the era of, of Ruth and Gehrig. Uh, they were here several times in the in the twenties and thirties. You see Babe Ruth in Knoxville right there, and in, in the middle next to the Corbella uh, fella and, and the cops. 
but uh, but they were uh, they were all here. It's a, it's amazing a list of people who who played there over the years uh, during the uh, exhibition period, uh, in, including uh, Ruth and, and Lou Gehrig, and Leo DeRocher was one of the early uh, uh, baseball players who was there, and later on Ted Williams. Uh, so uh, that was uh, that was. Uh, during during this this era of exhibition games and people would come out to see Babe Ruth and he always hit a home run it's like every time he was here um, uh, playing against the uh, the Nussle teams uh, but it's it's uh, it's interesting that that uh, we also had Negro League te te uh, teams playing there but they were not exhibition games they were regular season games so we would get like a Kansas City and Cincinnati would be playing together in Knoxville on both of them on the road uh, would do, be playing a regular season game in Knoxville. And during the uh, Negro League, League season, we had uh, among the players who were here were, were Satchel Page, uh, Larry Doby, um, uh, Hank Aaron, uh, Willie Mays, uh, early in his career, and, and surprisingly, Goose Tatum, who is better known as one of the original Harlem Globetrotters, but he played also played pro baseball in those days. Um, but also there was uh, live music here. And, and I just you can make a long list of the musicians who were there, but I, I'm interested that the sister Rosetta Tharp, who is uh, considered kind of one of the founders of, uh, of, of the, the uh, electric guitar solo. Uh, she was a gospel uh, performer and singer, but she loved that electric, electric guitar. And, and, and in 1951, uh, gave a, a, a memorable performance at uh, Caswell Park. Uh, but later on, 1959, saw an amazing show. It was called a rock and roll show, but it was mostly an R&B show. Was Sam Cooke was the, uh, was the headliner for it, but also Jackie Wilson was there. And Gladys Knight in the Pips, uh, 1959, uh, back then. Otis Redding was there later. Uh, but it was also, uh, we were, it's famous for uh, the baseball fields, but they also had a, a football field. It was known at one time as Evans Collins Field. Uh, but this was where uh, high school uh, teams typically would, would, would play. This was considered the home field for Knoxville High School at one time. Um, but um, anyway, lots and lots of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of lore about Castle Park, you know, it's if, if this uh, if this turf could speak, sort of thing. Um, the uh, the last uh, the Smokies, of course, were there for gosh seventy something years, uh, and uh, were by by whatever name uh, you call them, the the Knox Sox and the Blue Jays and so forth. Over the years, it was the home of Knoxville's baseball team uh, for uh, for you know for literally 70, uh, 75 years or so. Um, but uh, until 1999, uh, when uh, they, they finally uh, left, when they moved to uh, Sevier County uh, and called themselves the, Ten the Tennessee Smokies instead of the Knoxville Smokies. So that was the last uh, ball game in 1999. Since then, it was redeveloped as a softball complex. And that's what it is, what it is today. Still a beautiful place with, with some passive park parts to it. And you can still see the old First Creek uh, kind of as it winds around there. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, historic site because it's also kind of on the fringe of an old Irish town and you can just kind of imagine what was there even before Caswell Park. All right, uh, what's uh, what's the next one, Paul? All right, uh, I want to uh, pause for a moment and talk about the 1920s and this great idealistic movement to talk about parks and planning parks the first time. And again, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Tyson, uh, Betty Tyson was involved in, in this effort as well. Uh, but this was a, a big, uh, in 1929, a big uh, effort to plan uh, a proposed system of parks and pleasure drives. Can you imagine in Knoxville, uh, parks and pleasure drives? It was a whole new idea to have a connected system of, of parks and, and you know, kind of scenic, uh, scenic uh, pathways around. But you see, if you look very closely, you can see the Leslie Street Park, and, uh, the, and it says colored. That's where the, the, the uh, ball team was playing at that time. Um, but this was, uh, and you see Sturkey Park over here, it had that name still, that was, that was Chilhowee Park uh, back in those days. And the proposed color park down here, uh, uh, well, uh, let's see, that I, I guess it was is, uh, uh, Cal Johnson Park, which was already there. They may have been just a proposed an expansion of it. But uh, anyway, it's an interesting, interesting document if you get to see this thing. It's a thick book of, uh, of a city plan that uh, ran into the depression and, and also against some resistance among people who didn't really like living in a city and paying city taxes. But uh, anyway, this is an interesting picture that Paul uh, found, uh, uh, point out that this was uh, what was going to happen to the hill where we are right now. 
um, this was a, a uh, this this uh, uh, kind of civic complex that was going to sprawl across this area with big lawn and, and kind of grassy park areas and uh, museums and and, uh, and and civic buildings of various sorts around uh, around the fringes. Um, we're uh, we're somewhere on the kind of the right side of right uh, right upper side perhaps of that of that area. It's where our our office is today on on Walnut Street. You see. Um, or between Walnut and um, and, and the, De you know, the uh, old School of the Deaf, which would have been actually one of the one of the drawbacks of this plan was it was going to tear down the School School of the Deaf to build these kind of 1920s modern buildings there. Uh, and I'm glad we still have this antebellum building uh, there. That's now the uh, uh, the law school. But but uh, anyway, just wanted to show just to give you a whiff of that uh, of that that idealism about parks that that there was in the 1920s but uh, let's look at the next one Paul all right uh, this is a uh, this is Tyson Park of course and uh, this is uh, uh, you see this park was made for the use of the people of Knoxville given by uh, General Lawrence Davis Tyson and his wife Betty McGee Tyson um, that uh, that then they gave it it was originally called McGee Tyson Park because they gave it in in uh, memory of their son who was uh, killed in a plane crash in uh, in World War II uh, over the English Channel in uh, the final weeks of the war in 1918. Uh, but uh, it was called McGee Tyson Park at first, and, and it was mainly Betty Tyson's idea. At the time that they were talking about this, uh, Lawrence Tyson was somewhat uh, distracted because he was a U.S. Senator. Uh, Lawrence Davis Tyson had been uh, done almost everything in his life, amazingly. He would begun his career in the Army, uh, fighting the Apaches in Wyoming as a very young lieutenant. It was out there at, uh, in, at a fort in, in Wyoming that he met uh, Betty Tyson, who was there visiting her sister, who was married to the governor of Wyoming at the time. It's almost like a, like a Randolph Scott movie or something, that, but she apparently had some trouble with, trouble with her horse, and, and uh, Lieutenant Tyson helped her with, with it, and they just fell in love out there came back here to get married. Uh, he was stationed somewhere else in the East for a while and then came back here to live when uh, they, uh, they found out that uh, UT offered him a job as uh, heading up the military science department at the university. But uh, anyway, he was later uh, involved in the administration of Puerto Rico during after the Spanish American war and uh, was uh, also a brigadier general in the first world war and actually left the field uh, when he heard that his son was missing in the uh, in the English Channel and uh, and, and uh, arranged to, to ship uh, McGee Tyson's uh, body back to Knoxville to be buried at Old Gray Cemetery, and they're all three buried there together, one uh, right in a row uh, on, on and you can see it from Tyson Street. Um, but uh, Betty Tyson on the right was a, a real mover and shaker in in the Knoxville Park movement and and especially at the parks when the park was named for her son. And she established Tyson Park. She thought it was important to have a, a park uh, very close to, uh, to, to, to the city. And uh, that was, uh, and her, her original idea of the park was, uh, was pretty different from what, uh, what uh, uh, it, it eventually became. Uh, it, people described it in 1929, it is ideal for tramping and picnicking and campfire suppers. That was what Tyson Park was for then. There was no way to drive into it. And she said, I do not want a driveway through Tyson Park, uh, this park named for my son. Uh, I, I want, there's gonna be a parking area near Kingston Pike and people would just follow trails, get out of the car and walk along trails to get to various places where they could have picnics. Uh, it was kind of a, a more heavily wooded area. Interestingly, by the way, this, this area before this in, in the 1890s was uh, uh, probably Knoxville's first golf course. It was a nine hole golf course and they had the water hazard with the creek that they called uh, the River Styx. Uh, anyway, it was uh, it was a uh, the first people to play golf in, in Knoxville probably played golf. It was now Tyson Park. Um, but uh, during the same time, they were establishing uh, the first airport. Uh, we already had an airfield on the west side of town that was called Aviation Field, or sometimes called Bearden Field, and it was along uh, Southland Avenue. Uh, this was uh, uh, and and it was in 1929. Uh, that uh, when uh, uh, General Tyson was sen U.S. Senator from from Knoxville uh, was uh, was 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 you know, that 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 Betty he and Betty Tyson both said well let's establish this 
Nussel's first municipal airport and name it for McGee Tyson. Uh, so this was uh, uh, this was uh, uh, something they 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 did and, and something that has stuck to this day. That's why our airport is named uh, McGee Tyson for the guy on the left uh, who was killed in a plane crash. Um, but uh, uh, interestingly, they uh, they uh, completed the, uh, the Tyson Park with trails expressly for picnics, no cars. Uh, they had to remove two houses on Kingston Pike to, to make it happen. Uh, but they built a caretaker's cottage. They were going to have a 24-hour caretaker, a guy that lived there and was there every night. Uh, but in spite of that, there's kind of a bizarre story, uh, uh, even with a guy watching it, uh, a bizarre story. They, there was a big elm tree in the middle of Tyson Park in 1931 that kept, uh, they, they kept having this really weird damage to it. They kept finding like big bore holes into it. And, uh, and finally, they, it looked like someone had, had dynamited part of it. And they finally caught a couple of guys and they found out that, that there was this old legend that the tree was full of gold, that it somehow the interior of the trunk was, was, was solid gold, and these guys were trying to get into it. And they were lucky that they saved part of the tree. It was, uh, they, they did some massive surgery to try to, to keep it alive and it made a much smaller tree than it had been. But, uh, but that's, a, that's a, an odd Tyson, Tyson Park story. I did not know until this, this week, a lot of the stories I'm telling are kind of collected stories of things I've learned over the years. But this week, I, I just looked into Tyson Park and found a lot of stuff I didn't know about it. Um, anyway, Mrs. Uh, 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 Tyson uh, died in 1933, uh, May of 1933, after her husband had already died in office in, uh, as a U.S. Senator. Uh, and uh, a lot of her friends uh, proposed to make the, the park a laboratory for flowers, uh, a place that you could grow flowers, any kind of flower that grew in Tennessee, for example. Kind of like an arboretum for flowers, um, but and also they're going to call it a Betty Tyson Memorial Park and have a, have a giant uh, formal park in the shape of a Dresden china plate uh, with a sundial at the center. That would have been interesting to see. It was something actually that Betty Tyson had proposed at one time, uh, but uh, but that was in May of 1933. By the end of 1933, it was uh, the New Deal was coming in. There was all this money for improving parks and all sorts of things. And uh, her wishes for the park uh, were just uh, seemed to be completely, completely forgotten. All these uh, CWA projects came in. They were planning a large outdoor amphitheater to see 8,000 people in, uh, in Tyson Park. That never, for better or worse, that, that, that never happened. Uh, but they did establish permanent tables, uh, picnic tables and ovens, uh, which are there. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, with uh, the, the uh, the amphitheater, by the way, was going to have a 25 member orchestra pit uh, and, uh, and a dressing room, all this stuff. But, um, but also a fully equipped playground with swing slides, sand pits, and a wading pool. All that did happen. Uh, and four clay tennis courts. And this was, uh, this was significant. Uh, in addition to a baseball diamond, a public building with bathrooms, and automobile roads, as they called them, uh, connecting everything. Uh, and they didn't mention that uh, that was the one thing Ms. Tyson did not want in her Tyson Park. Um, but by April 1935, the tennis courts were finished, dedicated in April, and they had a, a big deal opening of the tennis courts with, uh, with some of the biggest names in tennis in America at the time, including Bill Tilden, uh, which is kind of like having, uh, if we had a, open a park today and had Roger Federer come out and, and play tennis. Bill Tilden was the, the tennis champ of the world, more or less, at the time that he came and, and, and helped dedicate the new tennis uh, uh, courts with a lot of his uh, almost equally famous uh, uh, tennis cronies like George Lott. Um, but, um, but anyway, there were, uh, by this time I, I, I've looked into this, there, there were some of uh, Ms. Tyson's relatives, including her daughter, who were okay with the, with these uh, these changes that were suddenly enabled by the the New Deal, but one interesting thing that I did not know about till this week was that they proposed a bridle path uh, from Tyson Park to uh, to the airport on Southern Avenue. Um, uh, after, as as they knew that their airport was going to be moving to Blunt County, uh, they thought that that might be another park and that might be connected by uh, a, a bridle path, as they called it, or a walking path. What does that sound like? A greenway. It sounds just like the Third Creek Greenway that we that was established in the 1970s, but they was proposed in 1935 that these two parks be connected, just as they are. These 
same areas are now. Tyson Park is still there, and it connects to exactly the place where uh, McGee Tyson Airport was, which is now West High School, basically, and, and the Armory. Um, but that, uh, to me, that's remarkable. But anyway, the uh, uh, back to the the tennis thing. Those those tennis courts became uh, kind of what Tyson Park was known for. It was uh, uh, local tennis championships. Uh, 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 Kyle Testerman, uh, a lot of people who were better known for something else were tennis champs at Tyson Park in the 1950s, including uh, uh, future mayor Kyle Testerman was one champion. And another guy that won even more games than Kyle Testerman did was named John Cullum. And of course, he's still uh, today, I think, is the is uh, probably the most durable Broadway star in New York. Uh, he's still performing in plays today in the in his 90s. But he was here as a tennis champ in the 1950s when he was also at night moonlighting as an actor at the Carousel Theater and the Bijou sometimes. But uh, anyway, a lot of a lot of stories of Tyson Park. Uh, that's all new. A lot of that's new to me this week. I just thought I couldn't help couldn't help sharing that. All right, next one, please. All right, this is Savage Garden in Fountain City. Uh, many of you might not have seen this. this. is on Garden Drive, which is off of Broadway, just past kind of downtown Fountain City area. And it's an extraordinarily unusual Asian style garden. It was uh, established by an Englishman, though, uh, a guy named Arthur Savage, who was an industrialist. Uh, he and his uh, older brother, who was probably better known in Knoxville, W.J. Savage, uh, were involved in building big earth moving equipment and, and uh, rock cutting equipment and things like that. Uh, they were they didn't work together. Typically, they worked on and kind of competing companies. But but I think his brother had done so well here in Knoxville that that Arthur Savage followed him here. Uh, Arthur Savage was several years younger. Uh, but Arthur Savage loved uh, Asian gardens, Oriental gardens, uh, and uh, built several of them. And the only one in Knoxville uh, is, is this one at Tyson, at, at, uh, at, uh, at Fountain City, which uh, is, uh, is, it was built in 1917 with, with Asian motifs, which were very popular then. Everything Asian was, was cool in the first 20 years or so of the 20th century. Uh, beautiful park. It was uh, badly damaged by a tornado in 1930, and uh, I think I'm told it never quite got back to what it, it had originally been. Um, and uh, and uh, Mr. Savage died a few years after that, and it was kind of fell into ruin for uh, for a while, but has been sort of revived in recent years. It's used mainly as a, as a, a sort of a playground, unusual playground for a Montessori school today, and it's not as public as all the other parks uh, we're talking about today. Uh, but uh, you, you need to, if you want to plan something there or plan a trip to it, you need to, to get permission to do that first. But, but it's a, a fascinating place. I've been into it a couple of times. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful, uh, uh, interesting asset just to see from the road. I mean, just to drive by, by it on the road is a, is a treat. All right, next one, please. All right, a lot of these parks were assumed by, by uh, cultural norms of the time to be for white people. Uh, I can't tell that they were, this was uh, very uh, uh, much policed. It was just kind of an idea of this, these parks are for white people, these parks are for black people. Sometimes black people went into the white parks and, and didn't get in big trouble for it. But, uh, but there, there was a, an effort in the early 20th century to give, to establish African-American parks as well. And the best known of them was the Cal Johnson Park. Uh, and this is uh, the entrance to it, 1922 it was built uh, some people uh, question about whether this is Cal Johnson himself in the, in the picture, but, uh, but I'd like to think he is. He was uh, a philanthropist at this time. Cal Johnson, the guy who was raised in slavery, uh, who used uh, hard work and acumen and, and uh, uh, some connections uh, and kind of a canny sense of real estate to make a whole lot of money in his life. And he, he uh, owned a lot of real estate, built buildings. He had a chain of saloons. He had uh, some other businesses. He had, a, uh, of course, the Cal Johnson building downtown uh, was originally a clothing factory, uh, the one that's still there. But uh, but the uh, 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 but he also had a horse racing track. And, and we uh, we're going to get to the end of, a, of and mention him briefly at the end. But he had two different horse racing tracks in Knoxville. One was uh, what we now know as Speedway Circle in in, uh, in East Knoxville. But, uh, but, uh, but a fascinating guy, and this was a, a park, and it still is a park of sorts. It doesn't probably feel as much like a park as it did in its first uh, 30, 40 years or so, uh, because it, it now is the, the site of Cal Johnson Rec Center, which, is, of course, is a, a well-used uh, uh, basketball and other kinds of sports facility 
and there are outdoor uh, courts uh, as well over there. Uh, but uh, Nikki Giovanni, uh, the poet, remembers uh, Cal Johnson Parker very fondly from her childhood in the 40s and 50s. Uh, she lived right across across the street. Um, all right, uh, next one, please. Okay, this is one of the most unusual parks in Knoxville. Uh, it's a, it's not a park; it's a it's a privately owned garden, but it is open to the public uh, at at certain hours. Uh, please uh, check first about what those hours are and and, uh, and and check that. But it's in the middle of Lonsdale. Uh, which is a uh, kind of a, uh, a working class community, uh, mixed race working class community up there, right around the uh, the old steel mill, which is a direct descendant of the Knoxville Iron Company that was uh, established there and, and moved from downtown where the foundry is up to uh, up to Lonsdale just to escape city taxes uh, in 1903, but it didn't do much good because I think about four years later the city annexed uh, Lonsdale. Um, but this uh, this ranch of gardens was named for a, a guy, a Bulgarian uh, owner of the factory, a guy who bought the factory, um, uh, born in Bulgaria, named Ivan Ratchev, a uh, 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 fascinating guy who uh, w had visited Knoxville in the 1930s and uh, was impressed with the uh, with this iron uh, facility in Lonsdale and bought the company. Uh, had lived in Chicago before that. But bought the company and moved there, and uh, he wanted to have a nice place to uh, had wanted to run a, a, an iron mill and a steel mill eventually, uh, and and also live on the property, but live in a nice place too. Uh, so what he did was he he acquired a house uh, near the the uh, the place, a house that's built in 1902 or so, moved into it, had his offices on the ground floor, but moved into a uh, kind of an apartment on the on the second floor. He was never married, just lived there by himself. But around that house, he, he established this beautiful walled garden, and it's got lots and lots of flowers, uh, flowering trees, uh, shrubs. I'm, I'm trying to, I think I have a list of the, the flowers he planted there. Uh, violets, tulips, daffodils, crocus, uh, uh, azaleas, hyacinths, um, also red bud and cherry trees, magnolias. Uh, a lot of these were bought, by the way, from Market Square, uh, seeds or seedlings from Market Square. And as you mentioned, you notice in that, uh, in that newspaper story, he, he won some national awards for this, this, amazing, uh, this amazing park that he built literally next to a steel mill, uh, which you can hear it going on. It's a noisy uh, place. It, it looks quiet. It's not most of the time, but, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And, and you, uh, it's, uh, you can forget that you're uh, in, uh, in, in Lonsdale by a steel mill. Uh, uh, anyway, he was a, a, a fascinating guy that I, who, whose name should probably be better known than, than it is uh, here in Knoxville. He, he died. He lived a good long time, died, uh, lived there on the property for about, uh, uh, what, uh, 35 years. Uh, and uh, the story is that he's buried there uh, in, a, in an undisclosed location. Uh, but he, uh, he died uh, in 1982, actually during the World's Fair and left money to maintain this park. And that's why it's still there, still there today. But uh, now, but still next door, the, the, the steel company, which is not a pretty place. It's uh, Gerdau Steel became, a, uh, I think it's not you known as CMC, is uh, this giant uh, steel mill right next door. It's where the only steel mill in Tennessee, in fact, they make a, a rebar there. Uh, but, uh, but that's something that people should know about. And, and again, it's open to the, to the public and, uh, and they have uh, interestingly, I, I was once invited to a, to, to speak at a at a at a bat mitzvah there, believe it of all things, uh, at at, uh, at uh, the Ratchet Gardens. But uh, but but go have a look at it's on Tennessee Avenue. Go have a look at that if you've not seen it before. All right, uh, next one uh, is uh, Sharps Ridge, and uh, this is uh, uh, as a as a deep history. They sometimes called it Knoxville's northern rampart. It's almost like a like a wall that was built on the north side of, of Knoxville, and in fact, this was the uh, the northern boundary of Knoxville until 1962. Uh, so it can, could feel kind of like a rampart. But this place, even in, in the 1800s, was a popular place to go for hunting parties. Uh, people would go there for uh, horseback riding, picnics, uh, uh, camping trips. In the 19th century and early 20th century, Boy Scout, uh, uh, lots of Boy Scout camping went on up there. Um, and uh, in, in, 19, uh, in 1929, there was a park and development proposal. Uh, developers had this idea to make a public park combined with, with, a, uh, with a development up there. Um, and uh, and this, was, uh, 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 th this was something that, 
it was a might have been a good idea any any year, but 1929, they ran into the depression and uh, and and didn't get ha didn't happen. But people still had this idea percolating. Uh, it, it was revived as a war era um, uh, World War uh, World War II Memorial Park idea in 1943 with Weston Fulton, uh, the the well known inventor, was one of the big proponents of it. Um, they built the first road up there, the first, the very first time anybody built a road onto the top of it in 1944, still during the war, um, and built the first aerials uh, for, for radio stations and later TV stations up there. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, Fulton unfortunately died before it was completed, but it was actually completed, dedicated in 1953, and has been kind of a, a war memorial uh, park up there with uh, some, some hiking opportunities as well. Uh, but un an unusual kind of long linear uh, steep park that, uh, that uh, probably a lot of people don't uh, don't know very well. But uh, all right, uh, next one. Uh, I, I think I'm going to yield to Paul uh, for our next uh, our next subject. All right, Jack. Paul. Thanks. Yeah. I guess Paul I'm kind of known as the. Uh, I did write a book about the Iams family, and I did a long talk about our Harry Iams a few months ago. I guess back in January, February, but. Um, Iams really is one of the biggest parks here in Knoxville, and uh, I guess for a long, long time, it was a name that a lot of people had trouble pronouncing uh, and also figuring out where it was. Um, I guess that's all changed now with uh, it being so popular and part of the Knoxville's urban wilderness and, and all that and just doing great things on their own. But it is named after this, uh, this couple, Harry and Alice Iams. Um, Harry, who I talked about fairly recently, uh, was a bird watcher. He was a naturalist. He was an explorer. He was... Uh, an inventor, um, and his wife, Alice Yo Iams, uh, born uh, in Jefferson City, Jefferson County. Um, but her father was pretty prominent. He was a veteran of the Civil War and um, was actually served as, was elected to serve as the first mayor of West Knoxville, which we know is Fountain City today. It's not Fountain City, Fort Sanders, sorry, Fort Sanders. So uh, she definitely came from a very prominent family of course, Harry Iams also came from a prominent family because his father was the um, first uh, superintendent of the deaf school that we talked about earlier um, after the Civil War. You know, all public places really were used as uh, schools, particularly were used as Civil War hospitals. But uh, the name is Iams. It, remind, it re re uh, rhymes with times. It's got a silent J, so it's not I jams. That's kind of an old relic, I guess. But so Iams. Um, you know, they were very, very different people. Uh, Harry Imes obviously was a very uh, outdoors person, but so was Alice, but in her own way. But also uh, he, would, he could not abide a party, apparently, but Alice thrived on it and was really uh, very involved uh, in kind of the social scene, particularly with the Knoxville Garden Clubs and the Knox County Council of Garden Clubs, which she was the president of, uh, respectively, uh, probably in, in, the, in the 1940s. But... Um, while Harry was introducing people to, to nature and bird watching, as you can see on the right with the East Tennessee Ornithological Society, which he formed in 1924, Alice was busy uh, developing her own business. And, uh, you know, in the 1920s, there probably weren't too many women who were owned their own business, but she did own uh, a commercial greenhouse uh, called South Side, South Side Greenhouses, uh, which she uh, propagated plants and also sold them down in the market. Uh, hall downtown. I've shown this one before, but this is such a great uh, postcard because uh, it shows you, well, it's illustrated by Harry Imes himself, so uh, it shows you his skills as kind of a commercial or talented illustrator, but also it shows you how the original kind of home site on the original kind of 20, 25 acres was originally set up. And if you go there today, it really is not too much different. You would come down the road on a Island Home Avenue, turn in, kind of wrap around through the parking uh, area. Now, if you turn immediately left through the entranceway, and if you park along the greenway uh, towards the home site, that's where you'll see uh, the, that's where the greenhouses originally were. And if you kind of uh, not necessarily a uh, sanctioned activity but if you did scramble down off the greenway you would find some uh, foundations and that kind of shows where Alice's greenhouses were you'll see where the, uh, the Christmas trees are um, marked here on, on the middle of the uh, postcard the Imes family was supposed to be one of the earliest people in town that would uh, you know 
instead of actually having a cut Christmas tree, that they would have one with a root ball on it. And after Christmas, they would plant it. And they had a whole kind of growth of Christmas trees for quite a while until apparently uh, Harry Iams uh, burn a few of them uh, by trying to eradicate uh, poison ivy with a blowtorch. So uh, that's pretty funny, Mr. Iams doing that. But uh, there was a, a log cabin on the on the on the property for a while. But you know, really, um, the things that you you won't see the old house uh, where they live uh, that was torn down in the late 1990s, which was a little controversial. But like many projects um, over the years, you know, it was more expensive to redo or renovate than actually replace it with something else. But the old bird club house uh, over overlooking the the river was very important. Um, Harry Iams established the East Tennessee Ornithological Society and also was very involved in the local uh, Audubon Society, which met there as well. But the Lotus Pool is still there. The water pond uh, just uh, closest to the river, I guess, is all silted up and disappeared. But if you did kind of walk down from the original home site down, I guess it's called the Discovery Trail, you'd still find the, in the, lo the Lotus Pool. And also on the on the far right, you can see the Ross Republic uh, Marble Company, which was a butt in their property. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But just briefly, you know, there, this, there is still, I guess, some confusion about um, is it a public park? Is it is it a city park? Well, of the four daughters, four Iams daughters, which we have Martha here and then Elizabeth, Mary, who sadly passed away in a tragic car accident when she was 15 in 1932. And, and Joe Iams on the right. It was the three remaining daughters uh, when they were much older um, in the early 1960s that sold their property to the city. And the city got uh, together with um, the Knox County Garden Club and the Knox County Council of Garden Clubs uh, and, a, and a series of really kind of civic uh, projects um, made it a city park, even though it was not necessarily um, truly a city park in its entirety. It was really, you know, by the mid 70s, really, it was it was it become a formal nonprofit. But uh, it, it can't, that's how it kind of evolved, really, from um, a private land holding with the Iams family to very briefly uh, a city park and then turned into over to the um, to the you know the non-profit even though some of the land still is owned by the city and they I guess still have a management contract with, with Iams but Iams Nature Centre itself uh, owns a lot of you know many more acres than than the city does and it is truly uh, operated as a, as a as a private uh, 501c3. Um, you know, and how it's changed over the years and how it's involved, of course, is, is because uh, we, we talked about the Ross Republic Marble Company. Um, Iams first acquired Meads Quarry, about 55 acres, which is just the other side of the road. And then beyond there is uh, the Ross Marble Quarry, um, which where we talked about a few weeks ago, the uh, some of the, um, the marble was extracted, went over to Washington, D.C. and was helped to uh, build the, uh, the National Gallery there, at least the West Wing, I believe. But uh, on the right is this kind of locally famous uh, keyhole that you can walk through. It's about eight foot tall through that gap. And also you can walk uh, walk above it as well on kind of a land bridge. But I mean, Irons has just grown. I think it's like 320 acres now. They've been quite a, a few acres since I worked there. But uh, that's just a quick history of the Irons family. So yes, uh, it's fascinating history, fascinating people. And their legacy still goes on today in terms of through the educational programs uh, in South Knoxville. Uh, I'm going to continue. Well, actually, a couple of extra things on Iams. Uh, this is a great photograph, actually, if you go to Iams and maybe you can hunt this down in one of the offices. This is an amazing panoramic photograph uh, taken by um, probably Jim Thompson, but it could have been Robin, his brother. Um, this is just a snapshot, actually. This is just like one section of the panoramic shot. Uh, wonderful, almost like 270 degrees panoramic shot of Meads Quarry. So if you walked up, um, kind of past the gravel parking area and went up to the overlook, you'd probably be about in the middle of where this building is, overlooking the lake. And I think it was in 2016, Big Ears, um, the John Luther Adams uh, in Nook Suite uh, performance was all around this section of the Quarry, which was which was amazing. So there's a there's a lot of uh, marble history as well as the kind of the natural history at Irons. I'm going to keep going for a couple of minutes with Jack for, for Jack take a little break. But um, switching gears to the other end of the, the county, really, um, I want to talk about just a series of kind of West Knox 
Bill Parks, and not necessarily historical in their own right, uh, but they do tell stories. So uh, we'll start at Founders, Founders Park in, in Farragut for a moment. And it's worth going just to, to get out and see a new place, uh, part of town. There's uh, the, the creek running through there and a wonderful series of uh, little trails. And they have some uh, kind of re reminds me of Sim Central Park in New York a little bit. They, they have a series of kind of um, whimsical statues, as you might say, that kind of give a little personality to the park. But from a historical uh, standpoint or a history standpoint, it, I think it's probably one of the most historical interpreted parks there is. And I don't know how I lost count the other day when I was in there taking some photographs. Uh, you can learn about Native American settlements, how they came, you know, connect to Knoxville history. You can learn more about Pleasant Forest Church and Cemetery, which I think we, we talked about briefly with, with Bob Wimbro a few weeks ago when we did the uh, Knoxville kind of forts and stations. Uh, you can learn more about uh, Farragut history through the local schools and also the historic village of Concord. Not going to kind of get into that history today, but if you're interested in learning more about local history, this again, this is the most kind of interpreted park uh, from that standpoint. Also talks about the Campbell Station Inn uh, and David Campbell uh, coming into this area in 1787. And if you can go down the road now, uh, I think it's probably what a mile or half a mile to the corner of Campbell Station Road and Kingston Pike, um, you'll find the kind of renovated um, Campbell Station Inn, which they, they've done a beautiful job on this little property. Um, I, I paid in the windows and it's it's, Nothing's happening inside. I'm not sure what the plans are for the inside of the Campbell Station Inn, but it is a beautiful um, site. And um, there is this uh, wonderful historic stone uh, erected in 1914 by the Bonnie Kate chapter in memory of David Campbell, one of the early settlers. And I guess I didn't, I didn't really take a, was able to take a great photograph of it, but behind here, there's this wonderful kind of little grassy plaza with, with a series of more interp interpreted um, inter historical interpretations. So really look forward to seeing how this uh, this this plot of land and this development is, is, is really going to be used in the, in the next few months and years. So again, a little bit of a kind of Farragut history. Um, Jack's gonna kind of pick up the story of Admiral Farragut in a minute, but you can learn more about him. Again, just again, another half mile, I guess, south uh, down Campbell Station uh, to Farragut Town Hall. Um, but I'm going to continue down North Shore to Carl Cowan Park. Uh, I used to live down here, so I know I'm pretty familiar with this park. But Carl, Carl uh, Cowan Park is named after Carl Cowan, who uh, grew up in Knoxville in kind of the Mechanicsville uh, area of town, just, just down here for where Jack and I are. Uh, studied at um, Knoxville College and ended up uh, being, being a teacher there and also the first paid league coach in the Negro Football League uh, during that era. Um, he, was a, he was a big um, kind of advocate of the belief that um, getting involved in amateur sports and professional sports uh, aided in the fight for desegregation. Uh, he went on to practice law. I think he's actually on the next slide. Here we go. Sorry about that. He went on to study law from uh, during the 1930s through the 1980s, when he was even when he was an old man, and was, was the first African member of uh, Knox County Court. Uh, and he became the first African-American assistant DA in 1953. Um, Carl Cowan Park was dedicated in 1949 and um, was the first um, park in Knox County for African Americans. And I'm not sure when this was done, probably a good 15, 16 years ago. It's uh, part of the Appalachian Quilt Trail that was developed by Knox County uh, Parks and Rec. And on the back of that uh, overlooking the river there, or Fort Loud Lake rather, is this wonderful um, kind of mosaic of, of photographs from the Beck Collection talking about Carl Cowan and achievements. And also at the bottom there, a little history of the development of the park. Of when, again, when it was set up and uh, in, founded in 1849 on land leased from the county uh, to the county for, from by TBA, of course. And um, kind of development there, the, the, the famous kind of swimming pool uh, was there uh, from like 1959. I, I think it was uh, probably about maybe about 10 or 12 years ago that it was converted to a splash, splash pad like many the Knox County parks, a little bit safer and kind of more inclusive. But, um, you know, kind of black history, African-American history is very important for us to tell. And uh, so if, you, if you're in this area, check out Carl Cowan Park. And what is really cool I, I like about the park is that there is this connecting 
little section of uh, woody trails, which is fairly short, maybe a third of a mile, but it's really kind of delightful. And you can kind of walk through uh, to a connecting park, which is Admiral Farragut Park. And again, the county have done a good job of interpreting this site, um, Admiral Farragut, and this is overlooking the peninsula where David, uh, Admiral David um, Glasgow Farragut was born. And Jack's gonna pick up the story about him. Yeah, I, I love the fact that our most famous uh, naval uh, commander, in fact, one of the most famous naval commanders in American history, was born in this place that now is the most nautical looking uh, place in East Tennessee, probably. Um, uh, yeah, it's this little inlet and right across from there, and it's, it's privately owned and has been privately developed. And uh, uh, I've I have several things to question about how they run things over there, but the uh, but that was for many, many years, uh, a place respected as the birthplace of Admiral Farragut, who was, uh, he's kind of the shorthand is that he was the damn, damn the torpedoes full, full speed ahead guy at Mobile Bay. But it may be more remarkable if you look at his career that he was uh, the guy that seized uh, the biggest city in the South without firing a shot. He seized New Orleans by, in, in 1862, the war was only a few months old uh, by sailing his entire fleet up there and, and, and pointing his cannons down at Jackson Square. And people, uh, and people said, uh, we're, we're yours, pal. Uh, they, they, they gave up without a, without a fight. And, uh, and the, Union Arm, the Union Navy and Army controlled New Orleans and the mouth of Mississippi River for the rest of the war, just because of what Admiral Farragut did, did that, amazing, uh, that amazing day. Uh, he was the son of a Spanish immigrant uh, and born in, in West Noss County um, and, uh, and, and didn't forget it. He actually went back to his father's birthplace uh, later on in his, in his life, but was born here in 1807, uh, was kind of forgotten here for a long, long time. After the Civil War, he became a hero and there are people like William Rule and a few others who were on a committee to try to memorialize him somehow, but nothing ever happened. It was not until after uh, the Spanish-American War uh, when, uh, uh, when Admiral uh, George Dewey, uh, the hero of the Spanish-American War, the guy that said, you may fire when ready, Gridley, uh, was uh, remarked that uh, Farragut was his greatest hero and, uh, and he wanted to remember, memorialize Farragut in some way. So he was invited to come to Knoxville and uh, came here to dedicate a birthplace stone, which was right across that inlet. And this is the stone that uh, Admiral Dewey dedicated in 1900. It was a big deal, it was national news. There were three big, uh, a flotilla of with three big uh, river boats that started in downtown Knoxville and were loaded with New York Times reporters, lots of other reporters, uh, dignitaries from all over uh, came there and dedicated the stone at, uh, at that spot um, across from Admiral Farragut Park. Um, and, uh, and it was there for uh, quite a long time. Uh, uh, Farragut's uh, cabin was still standing there. It was later moved around some. Uh, there was some one story that it was the cabin that was at uh, Jail Highway Park for some years. Uh, but over the years, people kind of forgot about it. It was a private property and uh, you had to look across a fence to see it. And then you couldn't see it at all because they closed the road that went to it. So uh, but it was uh, uh, it's now a private development and they decided they did not even though uh, Farragut Square in Washington D.C. is one of the one of the most uh, uh, fashionable places to live, or what or was at one time. Uh, they decided they didn't like the idea that Farragut was uh, was born there, uh, or or being reminded of that. So uh, they hid it for a while, and they it was really rediscovered, and then moved to uh, to Farragut Town Hall uh, near the uh, near where that statue that statue is. But uh, Anyway, it's uh, it's uh, an interesting story. The whole uh, the whole the whole story of the the, 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 the of memorializing for it to begin with, which you, again we've kind of forgotten about it until uh, back to uh, losing track of his of his uh, of this this what seems like a significant uh, kind of uh, dedication to uh, to to his his birthplace. But uh, anyway. Uh, uh, the uh, the Farragut Town Hall has a statue, an interesting museum, uh, just the last uh, the last uh, few years, and, and I'd recommend uh, recommend seeing all that if you haven't uh, had seen it. I, before my my dad died, one of the last things uh, I think probably the last uh, car trip I took with him, he was not able to get out much anymore, but he wanted to see that Farragut statue, and we went out, just sat in the car and looked at it. Right, I probably 
10 or 12 years ago, right after it was completed. But uh, all right, uh, next uh, <clears throat> next one we have a, 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 an interesting thing that I would not have thought would be a, an attractive public gardens when I first was aware of it. Uh, there's a place on, uh, oh, wait, wait a second. We're, we're ahead of where I thought we were, but- uh, Hey, Jack. Yeah. Just do a time check as well. It's 7.15 and we've got about eight parks to go. So hang in everybody. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, the, the rest are, are kind of uh, kind of easy, but, but the uh, is is World's Fair Park the next one? Then I thought it was. Uh, was you thinking of going to Cooch Park? Uh, oh, I had uh, the UT uh, uh, Garden next, but uh, oh, you know what? I've forgotten that. I completely yeah, yeah, apologize. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, no, no, that's all right. That's all right. We'll we'll, we'll do uh, we'll do uh, World's Fair Park uh, and uh, or Cooch Park or whatever World's Fair Park. Um, World's Fair Park was uh, was a, a, a a long time coming it was it's a, a an extraordinary park unlike uh, i think most cities don't have a, a world's fair park um and uh but of course it's the the site of the 1982 world's fair um it's uh it was some years of, of agony i remember there were some worthwhile things that were there for for the first 20 years or so but there were so many plans that fell through and so forth but it was not until the Knoxville convention center was built on the site uh, that they really redid the park and I think made it a, a, a pretty functional a functional park uh, uh, about 20 years ago. It's uh, unique in some ways. It has multiple historic buildings uh, as the World's Fair was unique. It was unusual for a World's Fair to use historic buildings, but we did that here. Uh, plus the War Memorial, which is a, a remarkable thing to see uh, on any day. And uh, and this uh, statue of, uh, of Sergei Romanov. Uh, that's, uh, it's the only statue full-size statue of Rachmaninoff uh, is actually bigger than full-size in the Western Hemisphere. And of course, it's there because uh, Rachmaninoff gave the last performance of his entire career in Knoxville in 1943 at, uh, at UT's uh, alumni, uh, alumni hall. Um, but uh, but the, uh, uh, there, there are lots of things uh, remembering the park, the, uh, remembering the, the World's Fair, the Court of Flags is there with the 23 flags of the 23 nations that were involved. Uh, but this uh, the statue, by the way, was downtown for many years before it was actually finally bronzed and installed. It was uh, the gift of a uh, Russian sculptor named Viktor Bokharov. Uh, and it was just downtown uh, unbronzed until 2003, people raised money and, and, and bronzed it and put it, uh, put it in place there facing uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the hill where, the, uh, where his last concert was. Uh, all right, next one is uh, Cooch Park, uh, and this is uh, well known to anyone downtown. Um, it was established about uh, 40 years ago. Um, uh, Charles Cooch was uh, an interesting guy, and he's not the, uh, there's a statue of a guy on the corner that a lot of people think is Charles Cooch that looks like this guy. This is the real Char Charles Cooch. Uh, he was uh, best known as a photographer uh, and a, uh, an especially fond photographer. He, he worked for TVA and had a lot of practical uses for his photography, but he had an artistic sense too, so much so that uh, his photography of TVA dams and power stations made it into the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, they're very dramatic pictures, many of them. This is one of them, uh, the Hiawassee Dam. This is, uh, but he just did, did uh, amazing work. And a lot of people didn't know that he was uh, a quiet, he didn't have any kids, it just kind of quietly accumulated money and did some, uh, was pretty smart with the stock market, I think, but uh, that people were pretty surprised that when he died in his 90s, about 1981, I think it was, uh, he left the city a, a million dollars to establish a park uh, downtown. So that's what we have uh, today, thanks to thanks to Charlie Crooch. Um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, it's uh, it's cool. I think he wanted a park, I think, expressly to remind people of, uh, of the place they live, of the, of the Smoky Mountains. His family was kind of an early pioneer in, in, uh, in terms of hiking the Smoky Mountains long before there were trails there. Um, but uh, next uh, one is, uh, is uh, uh, Morningside Park. And this is the, the best, part, best known part of Morningside Park, which is Haley Heritage Square. Uh, that's a statue of, uh, of, uh, of Alex Haley, uh, was, uh, and by Tina Allen, who has since died, a California sculptor, a uh, well-known sculptor, uh, but was she especially, uh, especially proud of this piece. There was the largest, at the time, it was the largest statue of an African-American in the world. Now it's still the largest bronze uh, sculpture of an African-American, the MLK statue in DC, of course, is bigger. 
Uh, but this uh, Morningside Park was a, a a positive product of urban renewal. I think it was uh, it was uh, finished around 1974, and uh, has uh, has been a, a a a pretty park ever since then. But uh, uh, next, uh, we're going to talk about something that was a pretty much a surprise: the Knox Botanical Garden in in Arboretum. Uh, this was uh, uh, on the site of the old Howell Nurseries. I remember Howell Nurseries. They sold the kinds of trees that are growing in the uh, in there in this uh, in this arboretum today. Uh, and uh, it, it was unusual for its round stone buildings, which were kind of a suggestion for for your gardens. Uh, but there are uh, uh, several of those that are kind of scattered throughout the park. Uh, but it was uh, they uh, they they look ancient. They look medieval almost. A lot of the stonework and and uh, and Botanical Garden, but um, but the uh, here's one of them on the on the lower the Castle Tower office and entrance uh, of uh, Joel ha Joe Howell, but uh, but they're actually from the 1940s. Uh, uh, but but anyway, it's uh, but, but as the Aslan Foundation, the amazing Aslan Foundation, purchased uh, Howell Nurseries, and uh, here it is today, um, uh, one of those round buildings, purchased uh, uh, Howell Gardens in, in uh, 2001 and uh, began the steps toward making it the Nostal Botanical Gardens. They're not involved anymore. It's run by a, a, a separate nonprofit. Uh, but one of the interesting things about botanical gardens is the secret garden, uh, an homage to to uh, a woman who uh, named Andy Ray, who loved the fact that uh, that her hometown was a place where Frances Hodgson Burnett had begun her her writing career. Uh, but it's uh, it's uh, it, it, they keep it a secret. They don't they don't advertise this. Uh, you have to wander around to you see it. It's not that hard to, to find. It's kind of in the middle of the place. But but it's uh, it's a it's a charming little. A uh, place that I, I'm told will change every year, will, will be improved every year. Great place to take kids and just kind of you turn a corner and find another little surprise that means something when you go in there. It's a lovely, lovely, lovely spot in, in Nostal Botanical Gardens in, in East Nostal. Um, but uh, but that's, a, that's a great place to visit. They have a, in the last five, five years old or so, a, a, a big uh, public building in the middle of it, very unusual architectural design. Um, next one, please. All right, here's uh, here's Lakeshore Park, and it's uh, this is I think has one of the more unusual evolutions of a public park uh, that uh, we have here or elsewhere. It's uh, it, of course was a, a mental institution for for 120 years. It was Eastern State, uh, also known as Lions View Asylum uh, back then. Um, it, uh, it as a mental institution it. They, you know, they had 3,000 people living here, and they were, uh, in some ways, almost self-sufficient. They grew their own crops. They uh, generated their own electricity. Uh, they kind of took care of themselves. They had, uh, they had uh, 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 lots of, uh, they had movies every night. They had dances. Uh, they had lots of things going on there over the years. They even had a newspaper at one time. Uh, but also has a as an unusual, I think, for mental institutions, a literary heritage. It's uh, is alluded to in Tennessee Williams. Um, uh, play something last summer, uh, which is actually set in Louisiana, but in there, there's a mental institution called Lions View Asylum. Uh, it's also mentioned in Carmen McCarthy's Child of God and then Peter Taylor's In the Tennessee Country. Um, and, uh, and also was the site of Johnny Cash's only uh, show for a mental institution. He loved to do prisons, but in the uh, early 70s, he came here uh, to do a, a special show there. Uh, it, it began, of course, with uh, the downscaling of, of institutions, mental institutions everywhere. Uh, it was downscaling. Look how big that was. We, I'm glad we have the one middle building still standing today. But look how many there were when they, when they, uh, when they, in the early days of this, uh, of this, of this institution. And what a pretty looks like a college campus. Um, but uh, anyway, it was uh, uh, began being downscaled in the 1980s as they tried to mainstream a lot of their patients. Uh, and gradually evolved into a public park over a period of, uh, of two decades. Uh, Lakeshore Park was established in 1993. Um, the uh, final facilities, they still had some uh, mental health facilities there until uh, 2012, uh, not quite uh, 10 years ago, uh, but it's now entirely a park with, uh, it's uh, a, a, a great place to, a great place for events. Um, but uh, next one, uh, just briefly, is is the uh, another literary uh, uh, connection. It's uh, James Agee Park, and uh, this is uh, a little pocket park in Fort Sanders. 
that was established by an interesting committee that included uh, everybody from R.B. Morris, uh, the rock and roll and, and, and uh, singer songwriter, uh, to Wilma Dykeman. I think one of her last gestures uh, was uh, the well-known writer was to help uh, establish James A.G. Park. Uh, it was uh, finished in uh, 2003 uh, and was dedicated with a rare visit from uh, A.G.'s daughter, Dee Dee, who has since, has since died. Uh, it's about a block from the original A.G. home site on Laurel Avenue at, at James A.G. Street. Um, uh, the, uh, I was there with uh, as for the actor who portrayed A.G. in uh, the 1962, 63 movie, All the Way Home, Michael Carney. Uh, who visited and it was a very emotional thing for him to come back to Fort Sanders. He said he'd been thinking about it all his life. Um, but, uh, and then there was a 2015 event uh, in homage to the Nossal Summer of 1915 in which we had a lot of readings in there and probably a couple hundred people were there. It was a big, a big deal. All right, next we have a, a, a pretty recent park, uh, High Ground Park. Uh, this is another Aslan Foundation wonder in uh, in South Knoxville. If you haven't seen this, and I think and I've talked to people, I would say probably uh, 4% at the most of Knoxvilleans have seen this amazing park that's been there uh, since uh, uh, for eight years now, 2013. Uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing place. It's on the site of Fort Higley, which was a ruin known only to the most serious uh, Civil War nerds who are willing to trespass to get into it and also deal with poison ivy and everything else you had to deal with to get, to, and I, I, I was in there three or four times over the years uh, and sometimes had a hard time finding it, but now it's it's all laid out there and you can see the whole thing with interpretive markers and nice paths all through the place. It's uh, It's got a, it's a place with, and here's actually the Fort Higley uh, ruin site. You can't really get a sense of it. It's like a weird cockpit uh, that uh, that uh, um, is, uh, is, is there, but um, but it's uh, there, it has great views and, and this one very odd little ruin there. Um, and uh, it's a, a cool place to see if you haven't seen it yet. A great place for a, a summer's evening stroll. And uh, and finally, one more we're going to talk about uh, the probably the most surprising name for a park uh, in recent years, and that's uh, the city Sutri Landing Park. Um, and uh, it's uh, it was it it. It's, it's actually a, a modern park and people all, all assumed it was a modern park. It's a riverfront park on the south side uh, off of uh, Sevier and near Island Home area. Um, but, it's, uh, uh, but as soon as they put it in, I began studying maps and, and found uh, from the 1880s, it is exactly at the spot. In fact, it covers the same footprint as, a, as what was a well-known horse racing and bicycling uh, track. That was uh, that was there uh, in the 1880s and 90s. Uh, it was it was uh, a place that was uh, uh, established by I can't remember who established, but Cal Johnson, uh, the, the the guy who had been raised to be a slave, uh, was the guy that uh, that that loved horses so much he wanted a place to race them and leased this area and established a racetrack there, um, and just across, right across the Gay Street Bridge. It was very popular for the, in the 1880s and 90s. And it was only later that he just he wanted to own his own track and get, uh, build his own track, half mile oval. That he he took the idea and built his own track in the 1890s on the in, in East Knoxville. Um, this uh, place was still there. The track was still uh, intact for several years after it was no longer a horse racing track, and and it was also a bicycling uh, track for a while. Uh, it was used by UT's athletic uh, track and field team in the uh, early uh, early 20th century up to 2019. 15 or so, uh, when they didn't have a place on their campus, which was really just up on top of the hill uh, for, uh, for something like that. Uh, but it was utterly forgotten, as far as I can tell, until it was revived as a public park uh, recently. Uh, Suffrey Landing is, uh, is named after uh, Carmen McCarthy's uh, uh, most knoxville based novel, uh, Suffrey. Uh, and it's chosen based on uh, an internet poll, but there's a, uh, a reason for, for Suffrey to be remembered right there, uh, because it was a scene in the book where the title character ditches a, a stolen police car, uh, which had uh, been uh, the, the car uh, uh, that was there was the, the, the personal car of of one of the most despicable policemen on the force, a guy named uh, in the book uh, Tarzan Quinn, a uh, guy that then uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, this was almost 50 years before uh, Black Lives Matter, but Tarzan Quinn in the book is a guy that's been a cop that's been beating up on black people and. 
and that uh, angers uh, Sutri. So he steals his car and and drives it right into the river and right at uh, it was where Sutri Landing Park is. All right. Um, well, that's uh, that's our quick survey of, of the 20, 25 most interesting parks in Knoxville. And uh, all right, well, folks, appreciate you joining us um, and uh, uh, and come back next for our very last uh, weekly uh, Zoom, probably our, uh, not our last one ever, but uh, we're going to take a break after next week and and uh, and uh, probably because we have a lot of of, uh, of in-person things we need to get back to doing, um, but uh, but really have enjoyed uh, in, in many ways uh, even though it's been a lot of work, we've we've very much enjoyed uh, uh, spending the last 50, 56 odd weeks with with you all.